Today on Rambling About Cars, Goodwood Festival of Speed is happening this weekend, and there's a lot of cool stuff there. We're going to talk a little bit about what's there, some vehicles that are debuting, some big ones like, I don't know, the first BMW M3 Touring ever, or maybe the new ProDrive P25, which is basically an Impreza 22B Resto Mod. We got lots to talk about with Goodwood, and... I can't not talk about driving 2,500 miles in a 27-year-old car this last week while I was out. So without further ado, it is podcast time. I am Christopher Smith and co-host across the way, Chris Bruce. Man, are you guys fortunate I wasn't here last week <laughs> talking with uh, you and Seth and Brett talking with Ted Ryan on historical Ford stuff. The irony there. Literally, while you were talking, because you record Wednesdays, mm -hmm. while you were talking, I was loading a 27-year-old Ford onto a trailer in Michigan's hottest day of the year, literally, after driving a 27-year-old Ford 1,200 miles to get it. So what an episode for me to not be here on. Exactly. <laughs> And you and I talked oh, about it afterwards, and you were saying how much you would have like the entire episode would have been the Ted Ryan part because I would not you, have. Shut I up. know you love talking old Fords, and hey, Seth and Brett and I talked to old Fords quite a bit anyway. So that was, was a, a great place. episode. So folks, go back. Uh, it would be rambling about cars episode seventy six, mm -hmm. the with Ted Ryan, the Ford Heritage Vault, the website that has launched. Yes, this is a new podcast. We are going to talk about new stuff, but that was such oh, a yeah, great episode. Totally. And I thoroughly enjoyed listening to that podcast while I was driving in my old Ford on my way back to South Dakota. But let's jump a little bit further to the West for those of us here in the States. Sorry, East. Yeah, I, I guess say. I, I guess <laughs> if, if you go far enough in the West. You let me tell you there, something. No. It's It's been a long 10 days for me. Okay. I even experienced heat stroke for the first time. So getting east and west mixed up a little bit, that if that's the only thing that happens this episode, it's a win. But yes, jump east. The Goodwood Festival of Speed, in theory, as you're listening to this, is happening right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, a, a quick shout out. If you go to motor1.com, we are going to have a uh, live stream, uh, you know, yep. live streams of, of the cars, um, I believe on... Friday and Saturday. I have, I would have to double check that. I know it's going to be on I Friday. Know Friday. I, I know Friday. Saturday, I don't know if there's anything going on on Thursday. Sure. Uh, but you can go to motor1.com. We are we are able to share the live stream, so you'll be able to go right there, see the action as it's happening. Um, and a little yes. promotion here. Uh, Jeff Perez from motor1.com. He will be at the Goodwood Festival mm -hmm. of Speed over the weekend, and he will be our guest on this show next week. And he will tell us about all the fun stuff that he gets to see there. And he gets to do something pretty cool that I'm not sure if it's under embargo or not. So I'm not so, going to say so what we it won't is. Say it but right he gets now. to do something cool with someone cool. So stay tuned for that. In something very cool, um, and yeah, that, in something that, very that cool. has yeah. that ha that has already been announced. Uh, but yeah, we'll we'll leave that alone. Go to Motor One on Twitter. Um, Jeff runs our Motor One Twitter account like mm -hmm. a boss, and I know he's going to be putting stuff live on social all weekend while he's there. So Motor One com on Twitter to see everything that's going on. Motor One dot com online. For all of your good wood action. Let's talk a little bit, Bruce, about some of the cars that are debuting at the 2022 Goodwood Festival of Speed. And now we need to preface this by saying, in this case, it's generally the in-person debut. Most of these vehicles that we're going to talk about have technically already debuted, but this will Correct. be the first time they're going to make a public appearance. Um, yes. And there's a pretty healthy list. Yep. And I wanted to mention that um, we were talking about this in our chat and our work chat the other day that it seems like basically Goodyear, the Goodwood this year is like its own mini auto show kind of sort of if you look by the number of debuts. Right. That just, you know, it almost seems like and I, I you know, a lot of people hate to hear that said this way, but this is like a return to normal. This is like 2019 levels of debuts goodwood stuff we haven't seen this much stuff 
debuting there in a while. And as right. we go through these, you guys are going to see exactly what I'm talking about, that there it's, is a ton of stuff debuting at Goodwood this year. It's it's quite active. And I mean, we're going to we're going to touch on them all. We'll focus in on a few yeah. more. Obviously, vehicles like the BMW M3 Touring that we mentioned, the Pro Drive P25. We're going to go even further in depth on those because I mean, those yeah did actually just very recently debut. So, so Bruce, uh, let, let's, let's get going here on this, on this quick list. Where do you want to totally. start? Um, so, you know, these are in alphabetical order. Like Smith just said, some of these we are going to dedicate like a full on conversation about other ones. We're going to just kind of pay lip service to. It's not that they're not necessarily important or better or worse or anything like that. It's just some are more important than others. So right. first and I'll, Go ahead. I was going to say, as always, if you want to see what we're talking about, I got to do the boiler, boilerplate stuff. It's been a week, right? Go to Motor One Podcast on YouTube. You can see exactly what we're talking about. If you can't do that, listen to us on Spotify, all the other audio platforms that we're on. We'll do our very best to describe what we're looking at so you're not going to get left out. Like, follow, subscribe anywhere you find us. We are growing slowly. We want to continue growing slowly because we've got a lot of great things coming in the pipeline. Now the Alpine A110. I, I mean, I, I dig, I dig the Alpine. I mean, it's not, a, it's not like it's a new vehicle, but I mean, no. this, this, this is a new special edition. That's, this is special. That's so we should up the hill. name it. It is the Tour de Course 75. It mm -hmm. uh, celebrates that 1975 Tour de Course rally in France. It's got a very vintage uh, Alpine rally livery on it in yellow and black with some white accents. It's cool. Unfortunately, Alpines are not sold in the United States and even mm. in other parts of the world. They're kind of rare to see, but it's cool that the brand is back. Uh, it's been back for what? A few uh, years, now. eight, five, five to eight years, five years at least. Something anyway, like something like that. But yeah, so Alpine A110 tour de course. Uh, Austin Martin V12 Vantage. That's back. Mm. That's going to be this is one we just this on the show i'm pretty yeah sure. yeah i mean it's i mean like, like i said a, a lot of these cars tech technically have already debuted but right. you're gonna see it in person at goodwood um i i are they gonna run i think i think everything here is gonna go up the hill i think uh, at, at, I, at some point even if it's just a you know like a like a, a parade pass right just about maybe some of the concepts and stuff like that might not but otherwise mm -hmm. everything's going up the hill even like you said at slow speed so right austin martin v12 vantage that better uh, not be going slow i hope not i i, I want to see and hear that thing going the bentley continental gt Mulinaire. yep it's which a, it, the Mulinaire sub brand is always confusing to me because the Mulinaire sub brand, for anyone who doesn't know, those are the luxurious Bentleys. And as soon as I say <laughs> that, there's like a weird twinge in my mouth. Like, wait, huh? Bentley's already luxurious. How much, how much more can you do? But that's what the Mulinaire sub brand is for. If you mm -hmm. look at a Bentley and you're like, no, this isn't nice enough for me, you get the Mulinaire version. And, and yeah, I mean, it's 650 horsepower. Um, it's it's not going to be slow. It should be going up the hill. Uh, but Bentley has a few others there. They have the Bentley they Flying do. Spur S. That's yep. also going to be there. Um, now, so real quick, the yeah. S versions are the stepping stone between. So you got your regular Bentley Flying Spur, which is super nice and super luxurious and fairly quick. You've got the S, which adds some sporty elements, and then you have the speed versions of Bentley vehicles, which those get the real like powertrain and power upgrades. So mm. a Flying Spur S is between a regular Flying Spur and a Flying Spur Speed. But okay, next. And then here's something that we're, we still are awaiting a bit of information on this. Correct me if I'm mm -hmm. wrong, Bruce. The, no, nothing came nope, up right. on this last week, I don't think. Uh, we're talking about the Bentley Millennial Project. And it's, as we say here, it's unclear exactly what it will be. It's, it will debut limited build alongside the Flying Spur S. Um, and that is a debut that is actually still awaiting. So that, yes. that's sort of the, the, I mean, that's sort of the, the secretive Bentley thing. Um, and that's going to come up a good one. Yep. And like I just said, Mullinaire means it's going to be luxurious. It's going to be mm -hmm. special. That's, that's what we know right now. Let's get to a vehicle we can actually tell people about rather than being saying we don't know. The BMW M3 Touring, that debuted this week. Uh, you actually wrote up the post about that. Um, 
And so it's finally here after two years of teasing uh, because they announced this thing in 2020 and we finally have the BMW N3 Touring. And by we, I mean people in Europe because North America and China yep. are not getting this vehicle. No North America, no China. And I mean, you could say two years, but I mean, let's be real. Ever since the first M3, people have said, oh, I wonder what a, a hot wagon would be like. That was like over 30 years ago. So mm -hmm. this has definitely been a long time coming. It's the first, whether it will be the last, hard to say. It's it would, would probably it would probably yes. it would probably be the last um to have just a regular internal combustion engine. And if you're thinking, okay, this is just a, a, a three series estate with M3 parts, mostly yes. Um you can only get it basically, uh, you, you know, you, it's you can, wider, it's long, yep. it's, it's, it's better to say it's an M3 wagon rather than a three series touring with M parts. It's right. You it's, know what I mean? It's a, uh, it's, I think 3.3 inches longer, just a little bit longer. Right. It's three yeah. inches wider at the back. They do that to accommodate the, uh, the M specific rear end, basically that goes back there. Um, and because it is a wagon with full down rear seats, to give it a little bit of extra strength because you don't have quite the same bracing back there that you would have in the regular M3. They do add some special chassis stiffening underneath the floor. All total, BMW is adding about 200 pounds to the estate. So uh, it, it is kind of beefy, but BMW still says it has a near 50-50 weight distribution, which I think is just fantastic in a wagon. Um, it's basically the M3 competition. You can only get it with the 503 horsepower version of mm -hmm. the uh, of the boosted inline six. Um, it only has the Steptronic uh, transmission. What else we got here? Um, it has it has the special you know all all the special modes that you can get with your M car. You can set it up for two wheel drive only for the back. Um, yep. It's it's X drive all wheel drive standard. You can set it up to. Uh, there's actually a drift mode for the wagon, which I think is cool, but inside this isn't like the m3 sedan this gets the big single curve display mm -hmm. uh that's 12.3 inches for the driver 14.9 for the um infotainment screen in the center all put yep, behind that. all of that is in one bezel so it in, in, looks in like one, one screen when you look at it really. right um and it also has bmw's new uh it's, it's got the latest i drive with their os8 so i mean it's mm -hmm. It, it's not just a, it's not just a, an M3 wagon or it's not just a regular three series wagon that they bolted M parts to. Um, there are quite a few very specific differences uh, that make it special. Zero to 60 is uh, what? 3.6 seconds. Yeah. Um, 174 miles an hour. If you get the optional M drive, uh, the M drivers package, otherwise you only go 155 miles an hour. Ooh, but dog. but groceries will never be the same. Bruce, can I ask you a question? Of course you can. If you were going to buy a fast, you know, M BMW vehicle and you oh, needed something okay. with all wheel drive go and, okay. and, 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 and extra space. I mean, are you looking at the M3 touring provided you could get it in your market or are you looking at the X3 M? Um. I'm I'm gonna buy an RS4 Avant. Oh, ho, 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 ho. slicing it deep for BMW. I mean, no. Oh, so, okay. If I got to pick between those two, I'm gonna do an M3 Touring because it's cool. They're gonna make far fewer of them. You're gonna see far fewer of them on the road. You know, uh, it's. I mean, it's going to have a lower center of gravity, which means it's going to handle better. Like, it's gonna have a ton of advantages. But if it was my, if somehow magically you gave me, I did the con the money conversion on this today in a story, and I think it's like ninety three thousand US if you convert it from euros. If you just handed me the money and said I have to buy something in that class, I'm gonna do an RS four Avant. But yeah, th there's nothing wrong with this vehicle either. I, I, you know, it. That's the whole advantage of the the m3 touring or the rs4 avant or what or the c63 wagon or whatever is that you get all of the um storage advantages of the crossover the x3 the the the, the q4 you know whatever 
Q3. Um, mm-hmm. But you get that lower center of gravity. You get that kind of more traditional-ish look. It's easier to make a wagon look sporty than it is a crossover, to my eye at least. Maybe that's just you know personal preference. Um, yeah, I, so I, I'm always going to choose the wagon over the crossover. And I mean, I'm not really a crossover or an SUV person, so I would generally choose the wagon as well. But the reason I ask the question is because I was just rolling that over into my head. Okay. Aside from an advantage of ground clearance with the X3M. That's true. What, I mean, what is it going to do better than the M3 Touring? And again, if you're looking at an M vehicle, you're not really thinking about ground clearance for off-roading. You're you're thinking tarmac performance. That's that's kind of been the core of of M, right? I mean, I right, yeah. Why would why would anyone want to choose an X3 M over the M3 Touring? Aside from I just want an SUV. I just want to sit up a little bit higher or. Wagons are are nerdy family vehicles. They're not cool like a crossover, right? I mean, it, is that that that's what drove people away from wagons in the first place? Was just kind of that that nerdy family stigma. Yep. Does that still exist in 2022? I don't think it does, only because there are so few wagons left. Like if you look, especially in the United States, obviously, like we were saying, this is a vehicle that's going to be exclusive to Europe. You and I, though, are in the United States. So when I think about the market, I immediately think about the U.S. And the number of wagons available, I can I can easily count on one hand. Right. And so they don't have that kind of nerdy... Uh, like you were saying, or like boring or something like that image, just because they're so rare. Now they're almost special in their own sort of way because it's something different because everyone buys a crossover. It's, you know, if, but, but we're not getting that, we're not getting that kind of same uh, boring family vehicle stigma with crossovers. Are we? I think we're starting to, honestly, I think that's I mean, I, mean, I know happen. we're drifting away from Goodwood here a little bit, folks, but uh, I mean, just, this, that's this, rambling is about cars. That's this, this is something that popped into my head as I was looking over the M3 Touring and thinking about, OK, the X3M um, is basically the same thing, but it's not. I, I don't know. It's a good question. Uh, this so, is uh, this is a question that we need to hear from everybody on email podcast at motor one dot com. Comment on our articles, comment on our on our YouTube videos. Yeah, I mean, it, is the wagon stigma still a thing? Is the stigma of a family vehicle getting bigger with crossovers? Because I want to see more wagons. I'm just going to say it. I want to see more wagons. Sure. So uh, one, I let me have my yep. last two cents and then we'll you, move you on. Got it, you. you got it. You got um, it. So my wife and I have been watching, and I don't know if anyone... I hope some of our viewers remember this, but VH1 had a series. They had, I love the eighties and I love the nineties. Mm. And my wife and I have started rewatching those at night as kind of our bedtime programming because kind of, it's just that nostalgia hit. And there is, I, I forget what year I want to say it's 96 or 97. I forget which one it is exactly, but they talk about soccer moms and how they traded in their uh, minivans for SUVs. And they show these, you know, period photos from 96 or 97 of people hauling their kids into expeditions and explorers and stuff like that. And, you know, that's the thing is that there was the station wagon era, there was the minivan era, and then there was the SUV era. And again, you and I, as we're talking about this, how many minivans can you name? There's what? The Sequoia, there's the Odyssey, there's the Pacifica, and what's the Kia? Sedona? Is that what it's called? Um, no. The the carnival, yeah, um, which which is really designed to look like an SUV, but it still has the. I mean, it, it's a minivan. It still has. But again, it, on it one hand, I'm counting the number of minivans on the market. Mm-hmm. That you know, crossovers have just become kind of the answer to the question of you need a family vehicle. Here you go. Then you can have it in big or small or medium or whatever. But that has left wagons and minivans to a certain uh, certain extent um but kind of in the lurch and that's what makes them cool is because you don't see them all the time because when you don't see something all the time it becomes interesting but here's a question i'll ask 
have minivans left behind the family vehicle stigma? I don't I don't feel like they have. I feel like when I, you see a minivan, you you still just kind of get that same it its primary focus is to shuttle the family around. And with station with station wagons these days, I don't get that vibe. I don't get the vibe of this is the this is the family vehicle. I get the vibe of this is still just a fun ass car to drive, but you can carry your camping gear in the back if if you want to have fun and then mm-hmm. just camp out for the night, right? I mean, do minivans? Uh, I mean, do you, how do you feel about minivans? I know, <laughs> I can't hey, believe, we, dude. We, we gotta change. Rambling. I I, I want to like this is an interesting conversation. Um, but I thirty, think 30 what, seconds. Yeah, I think what's interesting is. I think, and I, 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 I'm being, I know my parents listen to this show, so I'm literally trying to tailor this message to them um, (laughs) and I'm being charitable here, but I think a lot of older people really love their minivans. And that is kind of where that market has gone, where I know my mother-in-law had a Dodge minivan forever because she could essentially treat it as a pickup truck and load stuff into it. My parents, who I know are literally listening to this show, they use it as a dog hauler. My parents have a Chrysler Pacifica and a Bernie's Mountain Dog. And it's literally the only reason that they have a vehicle that's so big is because they can ha- they can haul their giant dog in it. Like, And, uh, you know, you think about people who like go antiquing and stuff like that. I don't know that they're family vehicles anymore. I think a lot of times, and this is something I've heard from other people, is that they're easier to get into than a crossover or a pickup truck or something like that. So people who might be older might have mobility issues, but still want a large-ish type vehicle, that a minivan is perfect for them because it still has that kind of uh, low-ish ride height. You can get into it easily, but you can still throw a ton of stuff behind you. You And so I don't know if it's a family vehicle anymore. I think it's like, and I'm not trying to be, I think it might be an older person vehicle now. It's, I mean, minivans. Am I? I'll, I, I don't I'll know. If I'm being an. They're, they're a way. Be, that, they're but. a way better family vehicle than SUVs. Uh, just, just yeah. for the folks that aren't necessarily looking to go climb rocks at Moab or something. Totally. Yeah. You, you, you know, but okay. We'll, we we'll have, have to, to discuss topics. this another time. So we that that was like a, that was like two minutes thirty seconds. We're good. There's more stuff at Goodwood, folks. I promise. There's more cool stuff. There are more BMWs. The M4 yep. CSL is going to be there. And yes, yep. the M4 and- debuted a while ago, but you're going to see it in person at Goodwood. Well, um, no, the M4 CSL. That's the hardest of the yes, hardcore. Yeah, like, yeah, the, yeah, the CSL. No rear seats. Like, you know, we are never cu- hauling someone in the back of this vehicle. Like, nope. it's, you know. Basically, it is the one that you get if you plan on taking it to the track or you just want some. It's the hardcore model. That's what it does. Mm-hmm. It's the hardcore model. It's got more power, 543 horsepower. Just to give you a reminder, 0 to 63, 6, 3.6 seconds, top speed, 191 miles an hour. Um, I mean, aside from everything that we've said about the uh, about the nose of the 4 Series, it's a cool car. I'm not going to rehash our uh, our aesthetic opinions here. We're finally going to see it in action at Goodwood. Is this bet? Does that little crossbar? And if you're watching on YouTube now, you can see it. That crossbar in the middle. Am I wrong that that helps a lot? That it breaks things up a lot and makes it look better. Am I crazy there? It doesn't really do anything for me. It doesn't. Okay. I mean, it doesn't make it better or worse. I think so, it's better, but I I respect that opinion. Yeah, it's a yeah. small change, but I think it helps. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. Okay. What else we got? What else we got? Uh, Daytona, Ferrari Daytona SP3. We've talked about this. Yep, we've talked about super, it. Looks looks gorgeous. Looks pretty, yeah, gorgeous. Super small production. Super rich guys are going to buy them. Um, 828 cool. horsepower. Yeah. Can't wait to uh, see that go up the hill. Yep. One that we have not seen yet. This is the Ford electric super van. And... Back in, I believe it's the 1970s, and I maybe also in the 1980s, Ford did this series of vehicles. There were either two or three of them called the Super Van, where they would do a mid-mounted engine in just like a transit van, mm-hmm. but it would just be stupid powerful. They made you know one of each of them. It wasn't something that normal people could buy, and super cool. 
and there's going to be a new one and it's going to be electric and i kind of can't wait to see it like i'm guessing given the earlier ones that's going to be based on the transit um but yeah it's going to be super fast super cool not something any human can buy but a neat idea if you're listening to this on friday in theory, it will have debuted by then. As we're recording on Wednesday, the only thing we know so far is that it's making a revival. It's coming back. Yep. It's an electric super van. So motor1.com, go check out the, the Ford super van. Hopefully it's already debuted. Um, there's always a possibility they could hold it out for the weekend, but go check it out. Uh, I'm, 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 looking, I'm looking forward to it. It's not the yeah. only Ford there, though. Nope, we got the Ford Very Gay Ranger Raptor, and yes. don't get on me because that's actually its name. That's, I am that's not the name. Being yes, a bad person by saying that it that's, is. It's it's the it's the follow up to what Ford did last year, yep. um, with with their Very Gay Ranger, yep. um, and, and that was so in now. and that was in response to just some just just some critical commenters bashing, you know, un unnecessarily bashing people. So. Well, no, so I, I can tell you the story because yep. we have had commenters on the story criticizing us for it, even though we didn't make the comment. So I don't know what's going on there. But somebody apparently on social media called Ford's performance blue color very gay. And Ford looked at that comment. Someone there did. And they said, fine, you're going to put us down and call that color very gay. Well, then we'll make a truck that's very gay. And so and, last and year they made well, the very gay Ranger. And now at Goodwood, they have the very gay Ranger Raptor. And 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 to make it clear, I, I mean the 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 comment was used in a very disparaging manner towards. Oh no, the, it, uh, yeah, I don't yeah, know how the, that could be positive. The, but yeah, LGBT it was bad. <laughs> Team Q plus, yeah, no. And Ford was just like, no, we're gonna we're gonna empower these people. And I think it's I think it's an awesome thing. This is the follow up, the very gay Ranger Raptor. It's it's colorful. It's gonna be a Goodwood. Bravo, Ford. Yep. Uh, so next up the Jaguar F pace or, uh, if Brandon is not here, but he swears that it's called the F Pache. Uh, F -Pache. I, forget, I forget how that joke started, but anyway, all, all I, all I call it is like invisible because if you're looking yeah. at it, if you're looking at YouTube, cause I, I wrote the article, I think uh, when this debuted, um, I don't know why Jaguar sent these press photos because it's Put a dark a, purple car it's a, over it's a, a dark, dark purple, purple car background over a dark purple. It's like, I mean, I even I even up the brightness on these photos a little bit, and it's still damn near impossible to see. But anyway, I'm I'm getting off the uh I'm I'm getting off the subject here. The F Pace SVR edition 1988 will be at Goodwood. It's inspired by the 1988 Le Mans winning Jaguar XJR 9 race car. The sporty SUV boasts a supercharged five liter V8 with 550 horsepower to go with its lovely retro look. Yeah, and we, we promise to, we, we promise oh. there is a look there. You just can't really see it. Yeah, it's going to look much better in real life in person in these images, I suspect, because you yes. can barely see it in the photos. Yes, uh, we got the Land Rover Defender 130. That is the new uh, long. Well, it's not long wheelbase. It's long body, I guess you would right. call it. Because the wheelbase is the same, it's just got a longer body, and that gives it enough to add an extra row of seats, which, if you know, the regular, the Land Rover 110 is available with a third row of seats, but that only fits two people, whereas the 130 has a third row that fits three people, mm -hmm. so you can fit seven people, or I'm sorry, eight people inside of this uh, uh, Defender. So it's the big Defender, put it that way. No idea if they're going to run it up the hill. It's not available with the V8, so I bet I, they will. It, it it won't be super fast, but I bet they'll fill it up with um, you know, with all three rows of people and run it oh, up totally. the hill. That yeah. would be totally fun. Or may or maybe they'll just be like, yeah, we don't even need to stay on the track because it's a Land Rover Defender. We'll just we'll just go this way. Zing. Yep. And then you uh, had the Land Rover Range Rover Sport that's going to be there that debuted earlier this year. Yep. And we talked um, about this one earlier on the show. Yep. It's a Land Rover Range Rover Sport. It's this tinier version of the Range Rover. It's cool. It looks pretty good. That's kind of all I got to say. Smith, you got anything yeah. else to say about this one? Uh, I mean, we've been there, done that. We've covered it. Yeah. So it's just making its in-person debut at Goodwood. Yep. I mean, it, it's a good-looking SUV. Yeah, um, totally. So we'll, we'll see how it does. 
Lexus EV sports car concept. I'm really keen to see this one um, in person. And by in person, I mean um, on video because I'm not actually in Goodwood this weekend. But um, this this cropped up last December, if I remember correctly, Bruce. Um, yeah, this is one of the concepts they showed. Lexus and Toyota showed mm -hmm. off. Was it 15 or 17 EV concepts? And apparently this is one they decided to actually put into production. Because if you remember, all of those were renderings. None of those were real vehicles yeah. that you can actually touch I and mean, feel. We are we are still looking at this as a concept, but right. uh, it, it's it, it's going to be in person at Goodwood. Uh, bravo um, for bringing a really sexy looking sports car, not a crossover. Mm -hmm. Well done, Lexus. Uh, Speaking the, of... We got the Maserati MC20 Cielo. Cielo. I like Cielo. Cielo. That's I, my I preferred think, one. I, I think Cielo is the right way to go. And you know what? Another great looking sports car. Yep. And we did an episode. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I was just, just reminding folks, twin turbo, uh, Natuno V6, uh, 621 horsepower, 538 pound feet of torque. Um, just like the regular MC20, but with more sky. Such a great card. Yeah, we we devoted a previous episode to this one as well. So go mm -hmm. back through the archives if you want to know a little bit more or jump over to MotorOne.com and see this thing in action at Goodwood. Mm -hmm. So the Mar McLaren Artura GT4, GT4, GT4 class racing is for essentially production cars that are stripped out. Basically, you take the production car, you take all the seats and all that stuff, you add some safety gear, and that's what it's for. So that's what a GT4 class racer is. And they did that for the Artura. Um, the one thing to note, this version is not hybrid, unlike the actual Artura or the road going Artura, I should say. Um, so you just get the V6 engine, um, but it's 287 pounds uh, less weight than the road car. So big difference there. It's 200,000 pounds before options. Uh, so it's a pricey thing as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, okay. and now, now we're coming up to one of your favorites, Bruce. I, I love, love this your, thing. I love your description for this car. It's, it, it's like the super deformed Batmobile in my mind. So, yeah, I, I respect that. So for people, this is the McMurty Spearling or Spireling. I'm not sure how they Spearling. want people to say it. Um, but anyway, it. It is an electric vehicle. It is a single seat electric track car. Um, it can do zero to 60 in 1.5 seconds. It is and a this thing speed. is, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, it is a top speed of 150 miles per hour. And it looks like if you took a Le Mans prototype and you put it in your dryer for too long and <laughs> shrank it down, shrunk it down, it is tiny. It, it's tiny. It's a single person vehicle. It's track only. It's not street legal. It looks cool, but it also is kind of cute in a certain way. It, it looks like you just want to like put it in your palm and like, aren't you it's, a cute little it's guy? It's cute. I, I mean, it, it does sort of strike me as like the the miniaturized, super deformed Batmobile because it's it's the same. Yeah. I mean, it's the same color. It looks like it has the wheelbase of maybe like a like a smart. Uh, yeah, maybe. You, you I was know, thinking like Ford Focus size, maybe. I, I mean, I mean, maybe just I don't even think it's that big, man. I mean, it's just it looks it's really tiny. tiny. You've got this little bubble cockpit like right in the middle of the car. And I bet if you were to stretch out next to it, I mean it's it's what maybe maybe eight feet long. Maybe if, that if might that, be stretching it. If that and yeah. I mean if, if it's eight feet long and six feet wide, you, you kind of get an idea. Um, I really hope this thing turns out to be a success and there's like a single make racing series for these because <laughs> I would, would love be. to see a field of like 20, 30 of these going around a track because it just it's such a fun looking vehicle like that that's just the best way. It's fun looking. You, you want to get into this thing and drive it. It's not intimidating, even though it has those impressive specs. Zero to 60 in 1.5 seconds. It's just stupid quick, <laughs> but it just looks fun i love it and and that's what that's what fun car motoring is all about yep so speaking of fun mercedes amg1 you and i dedicated a segment to this guy we all know about it it's going to be going up the hill you'll be able to see it if you're in goodwood you'll be able to see it in person 
I, I got. You'll be able to yeah. hear it. And yeah, I, 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 I really want to just get a good sound bite of that 1.6 liter V6, that Formula One derived engine mm -hmm. um, spinning up to 11,000 RPMs. Just a refresher. Um, it's hybrid with that engine and three electric motors, and it goes 219 miles an hour, 1,049 combined horsepower. Years in the making, finally finalized in production form and debuting at Goodwood. Tell me if I'm crazy here. I would much rather drive the Spearling or Spireling, <laughs> however you want to say it, versus the AMG One. Not that there's anything wrong with the AMG One, but this thing just looks. It just looks so fun. Like I just look at that thing and like I want to drive that. Like that's going to be cool. But I, anyway. I, I mean, I think they both would be fun in their own, uh, in their own unique ways. Totally. I'll just, I'll just drive them both. I'll just be selfish and drive them both. That that's a good answer too. Uh, so we got the Nissan Juke Rally tribute. This is dedicated to the Nissan 240s or Datsun 240Z, Nissan 240Z, depending on where you are. That mm -hmm. won the East African Rally in 1971. It has the same uh, color scheme to it. It's got the uh, the lamps on the hood. It it's a Nissan Juke. Otherwise, I'm fine with that. Yeah, that's that's fine. Um, yeah. A little bit, of, a little bit of, of rally heritage there, a little bit of rally history. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the Juke isn't available in North America anymore. Not anymore. Still actually, no. still actually quite uh, quite active overseas. Mm -hmm. Yep, uh, the Noble M five hundred. So this is Noble's latest supercar. This actually, well, a lot of Nobles actually have had Ford sourced engines. This mm -hmm. one has a three point five liter twin turbo V six. Um, as far as I know. Um, they haven't finalized a lot of the figures for this vehicle yet. I could be mistaken, but at least when we wrote up a story about this earlier, 550 horsepower in a vehicle that weighs 2,756 pounds. So a lot of power, not much weight, kind of a perfect combination. It looks like a supercar. Like if you ask someone to drive a super or draw a supercar, this is what they would come up with. Yeah. I just don't know. I don't know. I'm ambivalent, I guess. I've never, I've never really had strong opinions for or against Noble, but um, okay. you know, can we? Can the world uh, always have a supercar, an extra supercar? Sure, there's always yeah. room for Jello, right? They're only planning to make 50 of them, and if they can find 50 buyers, good on them. Yeah. Yep. Now the Polestar is going to be there with a Polestar Five prototype. Yep, we're um, finally going to get to see this vehicle. This is yes. something we've seen teased a little bit before. We've seen the rear end uncamouflaged, but we haven't seen the whole vehicle yet. A production version is coming in 2024. So um, this is something that's going to go into production and not pretty soon, actually. But we are going to see a prototype of it at Goodwood. So now, since, I was out last, since I was out last week, Bruce, um, just kind of get me up to speed. Has has Polestar shown any more of of this vehicle, other other than what we're seeing here, which is still, um, you know, a, a largely camo wrapped uh, camo wrapped car? So I forget if it was last week or two weeks ago they showed the rear of it on just, just the rear, uh, it, just it, the rear end. It, is it? Do we know if it's going to have like like Sorry, a, an, an exterior? That's all right. Uh, an exterior debut at Goodwood, or is it still going to be in its in its camel wrap? I don't. It, all I've, they have said is that they're going to show a prototype. I don't know if that's going to be a camouflage promo, prototype or the fully production version. Um, I okay. can show you a picture here of the rear end. This is going to be Polestar's competitor against vehicles like the uh, Porsche Taycan, the Audi uh, e-tron GT, the Tesla Model S. This is going to be their larger um, electric vehicle with you know performance credentials. Um, let me, here we go. And so, oh, I popped up the wrong image. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Um, I know Polster, they, it, it feels like they have a lot going on right now. Um, it, it feels like we're getting messages almost... Uh, Maybe go. maybe every other day of a new announcement of something that's going on. Um, so I mean, they're definitely trying to move uh, move ahead. And yeah, we're 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 getting just a little bit of a look now. I mean, it's yep. So uh, if if you're watching on YouTube right now, the Polestar Three will be their crossover. 
Uh, that is the one on the left here. The Polestar 4 is going to be a coupe crossover. We're not 100% sure. And as you can see here, it's still under it's still under a uh, tarp, so we can't even really see it. Right. The expectation is, and if you look at this image we're looking at, it seems to have kind of the same physical footprint as the three. So it might just be a coupe crossover version of it, but that's going to be the Polestar 4. And then the Polestar 5 is here on the right, and you can see that at the rear. And that is going to be, like I said, their Taycan, e-tron, e e-tron GT, mm -hmm. uh, Tesla Model S competitor i'm pretty anxious just to, to see more of that mm -hmm. i yeah, don't know about you be pretty cool anxious to, to see more i hope it doesn't have camouflage on it but i guess we'll see yeah we'll see um we've got the porsche 718 came in gt4 e performance that's going to be a good wood here um just a little refresher there it's basically came in gt4 but without any gasoline engine no 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 it gets a pair of electric motors peak output of 986 horsepower but power during Normal driving is 603. The battery provides enough power for 30 minutes of track time. I'm Which they pretty... say is enough for a Porsche Carrera Cup race. That's why it's 30 minutes. Apparently uh -huh. those races are 30 minutes. So it theoretically, it could race in a Porsche Carrera Cup race. And I'm actually, I'm, it's going to. I'm really anxious to see this thing go up the hill. Um, I totally. bet it's just... I bet it's just, I mean, I think this is going to be one of those cars that people are like, did that just happen? Did it just go that fast? I think it's going to be just a real surprise of the, uh, of the event and just how quick this little thing's going to be. Yep. And it's worth noting that the next gen Boxster and Cayman are going to be fully electric. So basically yep. what Porsche is doing here, doing here is that they're priming the pump and they're getting people ready and saying, Hey, this is what an electric Porsche sports car can be. This is what it can do in a couple of years that, you know, you are going to have a road going version of this. Not that it's mm. going to be as quick or whatever, but the next gen is going to be only available as an electric vehicle. So mm. get used to it. And, you know, here, here's what we're doing. And I think people are getting used to it. Um, I think and, so too. And Hey, bring it on. Bring it on. Yep. Simpler components, higher performance. But the next vehicle on the list, oh, that's such a gorgeous car. The Porsche 911 yeah. Sport Classic. It debuted a few weeks. I, well, it was more than a few weeks ago. What was it? It was a couple months ago. Uh, it, it, it was like, I think it was like four weeks ago. I think it was like exactly a month ago. Well, it, but it's, anyway. it, yeah, it, it's been a little while. The Porsche 911 Sport Classic, just to refresh your memory, it's based on the Turbo S. Uh, but the engine is detuned, is making slightly less power. Because of that, they were able to get rid of the the side air intakes that you would normally have on the Turbo S. Um, and that gives the Porsche 911 Sport Classic this very, very clean, very nice wide body look, which is exactly what they were going for. It's got the ducktail spoiler. Porsche is only building 1,250 of them. Um I've said how much I like electric power, but I also love internal combustion power and sound. And I just want to, I just want to watch and listen as that goes up the hill. Uh, yeah, but I want this other one more. Oh, if yes. I'm being honest with you. No, that's, so that's, that's fine. This Behold is, this. Oh yes. Yeah. So Nardone automotive, it's a company that we weren't familiar with. They're from France, but it seems like they want to do for the Porsche 928 what Singer did for the Porsche 9, 911. And what I mean by that is they want to reimagine them. They want to give them more power, less weight, modern mechanicals, just like take the essence of this really beautiful teardrop shaped vehicle, but then upgrade it for the modern world. And so mm -hmm. that is the Porsche 928 by Nardone Automotive. Um, you can't tell immediately by looking at it, but all of this bodywork is carbon fiber. They do slightly upgrade things. If you're looking at the nose here, they add some little slits here at the nose. They add um, these uh, rectangular uh, uh, LED elements at the front. The engine now makes about 400 horsepower, which is a good chunk more than even the best 928 ever made. And then on the inside, they do this really cool thing. I'm not going to pull it up here, 
but they fit a digital dashboard. But it's not a digital dashboard the way we think of it today. It's the way you would think of a digital dashboard in like 1981. So it <laughs> has like awesome. pixel. Yeah, it has like yes. pixel graphics that it, it's displaying on, and it just looks so cool. Um, if yeah, you love it, the 80s, it's I mean, it's hard to get better than this, I think. I, I mean, just just looking at the lines of the 928, it's such an elegant GT car. I, right. Nobody has really done much with them. I'm very happy to see a company um, taking a step in that direction. Very excited to see it at Goodwood. And just one last thing is that as we're looking at the image here, what's really cool is that they're being really subtle with it, that like the front and rear fenders are wider than they should be, but you can't tell. It's not like they have like obscene boxy fender flares. It's just, it's a very subtle upgrade to that look at it. Yeah. I, well, I love it. I'll never be able to afford one, but it's right. a, I love the idea. And I mean, I love how they have the wheels. I mean, those are new wheels. They're, I yep. think, what they're they're eighteen inch wheels. Mm -hmm. um, they're new upgraded wheels, but they're styled like the old ones. And mm -hmm. I think it's fantastic. Looks good yep. all around. So, speaking, speaking of fantastic, of fantastic, and kind of resto mod modernizations, ProDrive P twenty five. Smith, you wrote this up. Tell us about the ProDrive P twenty five. So, I mean, they, they teased it a while ago of, you know, something kind of old is new again. And look, this isn't a Subaru 22B STI. Um, for anybody that knows Subaru, you know that car from the late 90s. The, 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 just the, the hot two-door Impreza rally car for the street. ProDrive has basically created a resto mod of the 22B. They start with a regular original two-door Impreza chassis but then they just i mean everything on the body that you see there the hood the doors the roof the wing it's all carbon composite um so it's a little bit lighter over it's not a lot lighter it's like um what is it it's like 2600 pounds 2650 pounds something like that not much lighter than the regular 22b but under the hood they have a modern subaru 2.5 liter turbocharged boxer engine that pro drive then modifies they upgrade the turbo they upgrade the internals they say it has over 400 horsepower they don't give an exact number just over 400 horsepower um the transmission that is now a six speed sequential box that you can bang off paddle shifts if you want um of course it's going to be all wheel drive uh what else do they do they they tweak the suspension a little bit it's got six piston brakes up front it goes zero to 60 in 3.5 seconds um unfortunately it is a bit pricey they are only going to make 25 of these cars um there's no mention if they're available in the united states i'm guessing probably not but the price is four hundred and sixty thousand pounds now if you translate that to u.s currency that's five hundred and sixty thousand dollars now That's I a lot for a Subaru. I adore the 22B. I know many listeners out there adore the 22B. I'm wondering what kind of two-door Impreza you could build for 560,000. And I'm not meaning this as a slam against mm -hmm. ProDrive at all. ProDrive, I mean they've been in this business for decades. Well, and the thing you need to mention is that ProDrive ran Subaru's rally team yes. at this time. Pro Drive is, you know, obviously Colin McRae and the drivers, they right. were part of that reason too. But Pro Drive is also part of the reason those cars won championships. You know, you, yes. you have to have a they, good car and a good driver. Yes, they Pro absolutely know their thing. They absolutely know their thing. Um, I mean, with only 25, I imagine they'll find 25 people I think that, so that that are that are into this car enough to where they want to get one. And I mean, this is a street car. Um, mm -hmm. This isn't a race car. This is a street car. Um, it'll be set up for seating for four people or has an option. You can have pro drive, remove the back seats. They'll put a cage in. It's aimed primarily at tarmac. Um, the suspension is tuned more for tarmac use. So um, I don't think this is going to be a car that you'll necessarily want to take on rally stages or, or, you know, go, go scooting down some of the, uh, you know, you know, some of the dirt roads, but 
yeah, man, if you love the 22B, I mean, they didn't make up many of the 22Bs back in the day either. This is going to be extremely no. rare. And if you park, if you park the P25 next to an original 22B, unless unless you're you're noticing the wheels, I mean, the the Pro Drive has uh, different design bigger wheels, wheels with, with bigger yeah. wheels. Unless you're looking at the wheels, you probably wouldn't tell the difference right off the bat. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that uh, is that just debuted a couple days ago, and it will uh, it will be at Goodwood. Yep. Uh, Rolls Royce Black Badge. Black Badge are kind of Rolls Royce special models, kind of, mm -hmm. kind of not quite in the same way as Mullinair is for uh, Bentley, but kind of sorta. Uh, they're going to have some special models there too: um, a Wraith, a Cullinan, a Dawn, stuff like that. Um, not much to say about these. They're Rolls Royces with special stuff on them. I, mm -hmm. I, I think we can kind of. Yeah, I, I think going. that. I think that pretty much says it all. Yeah, we we're we're getting a little long on here, so yeah, we, we are. Got, uh, we just got a couple more to go. There's the Singer. Two more. Yeah, there, there's the Singer. the Singer Turbo Study. It, it, yes. Is this something that came up last week while I was gone? Because I don't remember seeing this car. It was, yes. Okay. Uh, so this is technically the second turbo study. They apparently, according to Singer, they already have about 70 reservations for these cars. And so whereas if you look at a normal Stinger, they look like an early 911 or even a 911 from the 1970s. These more take cues from the 930 and from the 964 generation 911 turbo, which came a little bit later. Mm -hmm. And they do have a uh, turbocharged engine in them. Um, there are various power levels, but you can have it with up to 510 horsepower and otherwise you basically get a singer bodied reimagined porsche 911 one of the really cool things here and i'm gonna uh, zoom in on it the uh rear inlet on the actual 930s was never an open piece on the road car but singer went ahead and opened it up and added mesh here so that's mm -hmm. kind of a, a a trademark change that they're making to these cars um yeah, just super cool stuff. Everything from Singer is cool. Who's going to joke? But mm -hmm. yeah, um, Love they're going to be, like I said, they have 70 reservations. So there's going to be plenty of these. And who knows how many more reservations they're going to get once people at Goodwood or, you know, other events see them. But and I tell you what. Of, oh, go ahead. I was just, just going to say, when you're watching Goodwood, some of the most entertaining passes, in my opinion, are the guys running the older Porsche 911s. Mm-hmm that really know how to drive them and are just hanging it out on the edge because I mean, it's just, it's opposite lock from corner to corner. And, and you can tell the guys that are, that are just really familiar with the car because mm -hmm. I mean, you see them inside, they are sawing that wheel back and forth constantly, <laughs> right? Constantly. And it's, it's such an entertaining, such an entertaining thing to see at Goodwood. Uh, let's move on to the last car here. Last car. This is, we have it here. Jeff Perez, who is going to Goodwood, termed it the Subaru GL wagon, but that's not. <laughs> it's not. I mean, he's right, but he's not. You could say it's a Subaru GL wagon. Yeah. It's Travis Pastrana's new Jim Connor car is what it is. Yes. And it's, um, and it's going to be a Goodwood. It's an 83 cool GL wagon. Um, do we know, do we know the stats on it yet, Bruce? Uh, 862 horsepower <laughs> from a boxer four. Uh, yeah. the entire body is now carbon fiber. It's got these big, it's essentially like, you know, you looked at a Subaru GL wagon. You're like, I want a car that looks like that, but I want a car that performs like a modern supercar. And this is what you end up getting. You end up getting a vehicle that looks like an, a wagon from 1983, but has just, it uh, basically the body panels are the only thing that's left. And even those have been heavily modified and uh, yeah, it, this is what's left and it's fantastic. And I can't wait to see it. And I hope they do a ton of cool stuff with this thing. I, I, I hope... really oh, real quick. I really love the uh, plaid uh, along the sides here. That's like a lumberjack plaid. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's fantastic. I, I very much want to see more of this car. I hope they do some special stuff with it. I have a feeling there'll be some some special things coming up on it. So yeah. Tune totally. in. You can see you can see a lot of the Goodwood action right here at motorone.com. Mm -hmm. Uh just just check our homepage for for live streams that'll be going ideally throughout the process. Bruce, 
do we have a little bit of time? Let's take this a little bit of time and run through some quick comments. Um, yeah. be, because I know that there wasn't a chance to do any last weekend. There we weren't. very much want everybody to know that. Yes, we are still reading these. We are, we still want to share them. We want to get more. And just as a reminder, we do have an email podcast at motor one.com. We haven't received any emails in a while. So all of you no, folks out you guys, there, you've got an email, not like on a- YouTube. If, if you're listening on Spotify, listening on these other, when, when you have a chance to shoot us an email, say, Hey, let us know what you're listening to us on. Yep. Uh, we're, we're on, we're on something like a dozen different platforms. Let us know what At you're least. listening on. Hey, I heard you yep. guys on Spotify. And I, I think that Subaru GL is just a crazy thing. You just shoot us an email. We love to hear them. We love to respond. Yep. Um, share what you have going on in your car world. I'm going to be sharing a little bit of mine here in a bit, but let's, yep. let's read through, let's read through some of these comments here. Do you have any pulled up right numbers? I do not. I thought you were going to have that. Oh, I oh, yeah, I see. Okay. Second, man. No, nope, no. nope. I've, I've, I've got them right here. So we, we jump back to, uh, to a couple of weeks ago when we were talking oh, about the Honda HRV Ram TRX sandblast edition. It was just you and me in that, on that episode. Um, Josiah, longtime commenter. Love it. Keep up the good work. Thanks, Josiah. We love it when you comment. The next person here, am I going to pronounce this right? Uh, apologies if I mispronounce your name. If you listen to the podcast regularly, you know, I mispronounce everybody. Avia C Mix TV, Avia C Mix TV says splendid. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for listening. Ted Adam Green says great ramble. Thanks for discussing my DeLorean comment, guys. That was in response to I think the previous episode where we were talking about the new DeLorean that uh, that was announced. That's going to be at Pebble Beach. There was some discussion as to whether it does justice to the DeLorean history. My take was, you know what? It doesn't have to look exactly like the original DeLorean to to be a um, you know a, a proper modern interpretation. I'm in the minority on that. I'm fine with that. Uh, what else do we have here for comments, Bruce? Uh, so last week, uh, this was when the one with Ted Ryan was on and Seth was on and Brett was on. So we had three comments on YouTube. Again, you guys can email us podcast at motor one.com. Mm-hmm. You can feel free if you want to send something longer or, you know, whatever. Uh, so again, Josiah, frequent com- commenter, love the episode, love the guest, great stuff. Looking forward to Smith's return. So what? Nobody's yeah. looking for No, nobody's looking for it. Uh, uh, Gino Nix, uh, great episode, great guest. Chris Bruce was a wonderful host. Thank yes. you. I wasn't, but thank you. And looking forward to Christmas return. No, 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 were. no. Hey, let's get something straight here. Bruce is the glue that holds this crazy train together. He's doing all his work behind the scenes. I'm just sitting here running my mouth for about an hour or so. So um, last week's podcast uh, well, wait, I got one last one. And okay, lastly, okay, go ahead. Vampire go ahead. Bear 13, who another frequent commenter. Yes. This was a great episode. Um, I got the news about the Ford Archive in my newsletter. And yes, Chris Bruce, you did a great job. So uh, all very, very kind comments. Yes, thank you very much. Keep them coming. Even the not so kind comments, any feedback you have. Yeah. Comment on our YouTube page, Motor One. Uh, podcast comment on the article that goes up every friday comment um anywhere comment on your grandmother's facebook page hey (laughs) i just listened to this podcast called rambling about cars they rambled about some really cool stuff get it out there real quick before we start talking about smith's trip i wanted to throw this out Mm. here um and i i've been talking to several people about this today uh, uh, in terms of future guests, is there anyone you think that we should have on, whether it's yes. an actual individual or just a type of person? You know, we've had car detailers, we've had designers, we've had collectors, we've had, you know, all sorts of stuff. But if there is someone we've mi- been missing, I would really like to get an engineer on at some point and kind of talk to him about that. You know, but a type of person or a specific person, Either comment on this episode or podcast at motorone.com. Let me know. And I'm kind of the guest booker. And I, you know, I'll I'll try. There is, I can, I'm going to be very, very, very vague here. There's a celebrity we've been trying to get for months now who I really hope someday that we get on. Um, But, you know, 
just know that we try to get some guests who don't necessarily come on the show. But I also want to hear from you if there's someone you think we should have on. Let or us even know. if you think there's someone we should have back, let me know. Yeah, back especially. Know. I can probably get those people. Bruce um, is really good at, at getting people. Every time I send out uh, queries, it's, it's like I, I don't even get a response back. Yes, I'm talking about you, Gina, darling. I know you like cars, and I know you have an amazing Twitch following, and I know you're a G4 co-host now. You need to come on rambling about cars and talk cars with us because you've done some really cool drift stuff. You would be at home here. So, and we and we do have we do have some other guests in the pipeline. Oh, totally. um, we do yeah. have some things coming up that are going to be that are going to be pretty cool. But yeah, but I just want like feedback. suggestions. If there's someone who is a frequent listener and thinks, oh, they would be good, give me their name and I'll see what I can do. Or just a general topic like. You want someone, like I said, who's an engineer, who does X or Y, who's an executive at X or whatever. Just give me an idea and I'll see yeah. what I can do because I want to I want to make a show people want to listen to. Yes, absolutely. Now, here's the point where we might lose listeners because, hey, you know what? Yeah, I just I just did a little bit of a road trip in an older car. Um, I experienced some things that I hadn't experienced before, so. Um, you know, I, I, I thought I would just spend a little bit of time if that's all right, Bruce, and just kind of talk to people about some of my experiences here on this, uh, 2,531 mile journey. I took Jeez. in my, uh, in my 1995 Ford Mustang convertible with the very loud exhaust. Um, for those who follow me on Twitter, um, I did post fairly regular updates just, just with some photos. Um, of course the, the crux of the trip was, I'm actually preparing to move to Michigan from South Dakota. That's hopefully going to happen later this year. Um, so this was sort of a, a pre-run, if you will, to set things up at the house we're going to be moving to, the house we're going to be buying. Um, in the process, a friend of mine, as I've talked about on previous shows, um, had a 1995 Ford Taurus SHO that he was selling. Um, and... Living 1,200 miles away, preparing a move, probably not the best time to buy a project car. And it is a project car, but there were three three factors here. One, it's it's a very rare color interior combination. Um, and only Taurus show nerds are going to know that, but I'm a Taurus show nerd. And I've only seen one other color combination like this in the last uh, 30 or so years of being around these cars. And that was because we had one. My wife drove one way back uh, in the early 2000s. She absolutely loved the car. She had a little minor accident, um, slid on some ice. The car was unfortunately totaled. She was fine, but she was heartbroken. Okay. So that's two factors. Rare car, one that my wife drove and loved. The third factor, this friend of mine that's selling the car, um, his father, and, and him, they're both, they were both uh, really good friends of mine. Father, Bill Saunders, sadly passed away last year rather suddenly. He was just a, just a huge force in the Torah Show community. He had five cars at his house when he, when he passed. Um, he had a camping trailer full of parts. He had a garage full of parts. He had another shed full of parts. Um, so being able to buy this car um, from a friend who was trying to fix it up, you know, take away any one of those three factors. I'm not doing it right now. You put them all together. I got to do it right now. So yeah, I mean, as, uh, as Bruce is showing here on YouTube, um, I did drive out there in the Mustang. I did pick that car up on officially the hottest freaking day of the year in Michigan. No joke. It was 101 degrees in Rochester Hills, Michigan. When I pulled in with the truck and trailer to pick that car up, and for the record, yes, I did actually experience mild to moderate heat stroke. I'd never actually had heat stroke before. I've always, okay, you know, you, you get hot, you take a little break, you start slowing down. You know, I figured, okay, you know, it, it's not that big a deal. I'm not going to push that hard. Well, it's 101 degrees. We're down there. The car is stuck on the side of the house, kind of way back in the yard. We got some vehicles there that we can move that we can use to move stuff around very much wanted to get it started. Could not get it started. Um, the, 
the starter. I, I'm I'm like 99.9 percent sure the starter is is just cooked. The car sat outside for years, so we couldn't get it started. Plan B: we got an old Dodge Durango RT all-wheel drive uh, that we can use to pull it around with. Well, the Durango was having trouble running, and the windows weren't working. So I'm so I'm I'm running the Durango. It's 101 outside. It's probably 150 in the Durango. As yeah. you know, we're sitting there. Okay, I've, I've got a tow strap. We get back there. We get the car in neutral. We get the tow strap tow strap hooked up. I'm driving the Durango. Uh, you know, the the guy I'm buying the car from, Chris. Uh, you know, he's outside. We're worried. This thing's been sitting outside for years. Are the wheels even going to roll? If they're not going to roll, okay. You know, one. If we can start it and drive it up on the trailer, cool. Two, as long as the wheels roll, we can get it up on the trailer. Three, if the wheels are froze up, it's going to be a long night. Well, I start pulling it, and Chris is back there watching the car. And all of a sudden, I hear in this kind of shrill voice, he's like, oh, two wheels are rolling. Two wheels are rolling. <laughs> and then he runs around to the other side. He goes, he's like, keep going. So it was like a, just a couple seconds later. Now I hear... We got four wheels rolling. And he did just, I mean, it was infectious. He's screaming. I totally forgot that I was about to pass out from heat stroke. Um, we got the car pulled up onto the driveway, uh, but we found that, okay, the wheels are rolling, but things are still bound up pretty tight. Um, three of us pushing it on level ground. It was all we could do to move it. So we got the trailer set up. Hopefully we can just get enough of a run, get it pushed up on the trailer we got it like halfway up the ramp and no, they, they, we just didn't have enough strength. So no problem. I've got to come along with me. I bought a, an 8,000 pound, uh, come along brand new. I pull it out of the box, get ready to use it. And just from packaging, the winch cable is just completely bound up in this thing. I could not get it. I could not get it free. Give me a little bit of a, of give me a little bit more time and temperatures that weren't triple digits with like 80% humidity could have done it. But at this point now I'm starting to feel, I mean, I'm like hot and just exhausted and it's like, okay, it's, it's time for the final plan, which we also had a new Ford Bronco there. Chris's fiance had a, had a new Ford Bronco Sasquatch package. Uh, he's like, We'll just push the carp out of the trailer. We'll go get a we'll go get a tire. We'll just push the carp on the trailer with the Bronco. Um, and if you give me a moment here, I'm going to share my screen, Bruce. Go for it, man. Um, because Chris Ag was actually kind enough. I don't is that showing up here? It is now. Chris was actually kind enough to snap a picture inside uh, the Bronco, folks. The 360 degree camera works great. If you ever want to push a broken ass Taurus show with a Ford Bronco, you want to make sure that you're not scuffing up the bumpers or anything. We got the tire up there. Um, you know, the, the clearances actually worked out. It wasn't ideal because there's always the chance that you can, you can bend or scratch something, but the old Bronco with the Sasquatch package, just shoved the car right up there. Um, we did have to do a little bit more pushing just, just to get it over the lip um, on the front that, that, that kind of hold help help uh, helps hold the front wheels in place. But now at this point, it's like, okay, I'm hot. I'm tired. Now I'm feeling nauseous. And it's like, okay, well, this is strange, but I kept going. But then I turned around and a little gust of wind came up and I started to shiver. And that never happened to me before. And it's 101 degrees outside. So if anybody is wondering what heat stroke is like, shivering is the point where it's like, okay, you need to get the hell inside. So I was just like, guys, I need to take a little bit of a break. Never experienced it before. Went inside, had some water, just, just relaxed, visited for about 15 minutes, went back out, finished everything up, got in the truck. But I tell you what, I was still feeling off that entire evening and even a little bit into the next morning. So top tip from Christopher Smith on rambling about cars. If you're working outside and you're feeling hot, you're getting tired. Now you're starting to feel a little nauseous. Don't let yourself get to the shiver stage. Stop while you're just a little nauseous or don't even get that far. Just call somebody and say, Hey, come pick this car up for me because, because this is ridiculous. So that was my little heat stroke experience, but we got the car loaded up. Um, I did share some of it on Twitter. 
Um, mm -hmm. We've got some images right here. This is, I mean, you can see the Bronco in the background. The car was actually better overall than I was expecting. Um, I thought there was some rust over by the gas door on the passenger rear side. Turns out it was just moss from sitting outside for three years. Um, underside of the car, it, it, it's pretty crusty, but it's, uh, I mean, it's not, it's not detrimental from sitting outside. Um, by the time I did get it up home, I power washed it before going into the shop. And I tell you what, I mean, just, just power washing all the, all the crud off. I can wheel up the finish and the outside will look pretty good without really much of a paint job. Um, of course, the trouble is I'm going to have to replace a lot of hoses underneath. I'm going to have to replace the brakes. Yeah. Um, it has a transmission issue, which I think I know what it is that won't require it to be removed. But obviously, I mean, the engine, uh, I'm going to have to go through the engine. It, it's got a lot of work ahead of me, but I did get it up there, did get it all tucked away in its, uh, in its new shop. I now officially own a car that's 1,200 miles away from me in somebody else's garage. Um, but I did find covers in the trunk, so I even got it covered up. And it's tucked away, sitting up on ramps, ready to go. And uh, that's my that's my new project car experience. And as for the Mustang, I, uh, I drove it 2,500 miles without a single issue. Can you believe that? Well, I got a question for you about that because you you and I were talking before the show, and you said some sketchy things happened once you were getting back to South Dakota, and uh, we never, you and I just never really got into that. So, so kind of so, what happened? So, I I built the car just to be a local kind of fun car. It's very sure. loud. I actually I bought a, a nice Bluetooth headset. Uh, with a noise canceling feature to help with the noise because I knew it was going to be noisy, especially mm -hmm. like 55, 60 miles an hour, which I was running a lot uh, through Wisconsin and Michigan. And there's just a drone. Um, and then I got earplugs to go in with the headset. That actually made a big difference. Going out was fine. Um, I did notice that the air conditioning was a little weak once I got on the road. Uh, going out wasn't an issue because it stayed fairly cool. And actually, it was, it was chilly. Um, on my second day of driving, going to Michigan, I had the roof down going through the upper peninsula. Um, actually I got some, some photos there sitting at the, uh, St. Ignace at the Mackinac bridge, just beautiful drive across us two. perfect opportunity to just put the roof down, enjoy the, uh, enjoy the lakeside drive. But yeah, coming back, um, I came back on the second day of driving, um, I knew it was going to be warm. Temperatures were getting up to 100 degrees in South Dakota. Um, but it came with like 50 and 60 mile an hour winds. So not only am I dealing with the extreme heat in a 27-year-old Ford uh, with weak air conditioning, now I've got 60 mile an hour winds. And I mean, and I even saw a couple of campers on I-90 going through South Dakota that were perilous, perilously close to tipping. Um, I went through my first dust storm. I've never driven through an actual dust storm. Hmm. Um, visibility. I mean, you could see it off in the distance. Visibility dropped to about a mile. It wasn't a really bad dust storm. Okay, that's but not it, so bad. It, uh, but... I mean, it, it went on for, I mean, maybe a couple of miles. But it was just, it was just kind of creepy. And you put the windows down, and it's, I mean, it's like you're in a blast furnace. Uh -oh. um, I'm, I'm running the air conditioning. The air conditioning can barely keep up. Um, and just, just with the extreme temperatures outside, I just, the South Dakota speed limits are 80 miles an hour. I couldn't run the speed limit. It was just, it was pushing the car too hard. I've got, uh, I've got shorter gears in the back for acceleration. So at 80 miles an hour, the engine's like 27, 2800 RPMs, which the old five liter, the red line is somewhere like around five or something it's ridiculously low. So temperature is starting to creep up now. And I, I remember, um, you know, just from history lessons in the past, if you got a car that's heating up, if you turn on the heater full blast, you're basically yep. giving yourself an extra little radiator because you're pushing air through the heater core, mm -hmm. which is which is heated up from coolant from the car that will cool the car down. So, OK, I don't really want you to stop and sit for 15 minutes every every half hour. I've, I'll never get home. Mm -hmm. So. Off goes the air conditioning over to defrost, turn the heater up to full, put the windows down, still doing 70 miles an hour. And at least now, you're in a convertible. That helps. Well, well no, I, I, I had the top up for this. 
Oh, Jesus. Um, okay. Be- because I, I mean, dude, putting the top down with that much sun and that much heat, I it just it would have I would have roasted. So windows down, heater on full blast for about five minutes. It's like the car and I were one, right? We were sharing, <laughs> we were sharing, we were sharing this burden. The car would start to get warm. Okay, turn everything off, turn the heater up for five minutes. The air conditioning was working well enough to keep me fairly comfortable. After five minutes, okay, now I'm starting to feel like I'm about to puke. <laughs> cars, cars cool. We'll turn the air conditioning air conditioning back on. I did this for like two and a half hours across South Dakota. Jesus, um, that's a long time. Just, just, okay. You, you know, about every about every alternating about every probably 10 or 15 minutes. Uh-huh. Of, of, of switching. Okay, because the you know, the engine is just getting heat soaked, right? I mean, it's just creeping up. It never got hot, but I didn't want it, I didn't want it to get to that point. So mm-hmm. Um, I mean, this this picture that I'm sharing here is right at the Missouri River. There's a big rest stop um, right there at the Missouri River. The picture doesn't show it, but the winds are like 50, 55 miles an hour right here out of wow. the south. And it's 100 degrees, like 5% humidity. I mean, it's, it's the freaking desert. And huh. I've just got the hood up and I just hung out there for 15, 20 minutes. That got the engine cooled back down. I only had to do after that, I only had to do the, uh, you know, the turn on the heater full blast trick. A couple more times uh, for the rest of the rest of the way around the uh, rest of the way home. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> there was one instance, though, and maybe some of you can relate. And I'm going to wrap this up here pretty quick. because I know we're getting a little long, but no, I have to, right there. OK, I, I, I have to mention this because, hey, we love cars. If you're listening to this, you probably love cars. Cars are machines, right? They they they're not sentient. They don't have a soul, but sometimes, sometimes I'm willing to bet every person listening out there has encountered a situation where it's like, does this car understand what's happening right now? And, and, and that happened to me as I'm approaching wall, South Dakota. Um, Now we're starting to get some pop-up thunderstorms. Nothing looks severe. I had I had the radar up on my phone that I could see. Uh, I had a nice little kind of dash mount for my phone. So I'm looking at the weather radar and I'm seeing these storms blowing up and the temperature is still like hundred degrees and the, the engine temperature is starting to creep back up where it's about to, okay, I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to have to turn the heater on full blast again. And I'm running along about 70 miles an hour. I'm not pushing it too hard, but I can see the storms on the radar. I can see the storms in the distance. It's like, those are strengthening. And for anybody that's not aware um, a few days prior, I mean, South Dakota got nailed with like baseball and softball size hail. We get that fairly, we get that more often out here than I think a lot of people realize. So there's the potential for these storms to develop into that. And I'm like, if I can pick up the pace, get up to about 80, 85, I think I can get past these storms, get past wall before the storms get to the highway. And I'm saying this out loud, right? And I'm, I'm like, all right, Mustang, I think we need to pick up the pace. Otherwise, we could get caught in some pretty, pretty nasty hail. And Bruce, I swear to freaking God, I watched that temperature gauge drop from just leaning towards the hot, dropped back probably to where it was, it was definitely below half leaning towards the cold side without doing anything. <laughs> the temperature drops. The, the the engine temperature drops and it's like so you're saying you own christine so it's like okay let's go so i rolled it up to 85 and the engine temperature crept back up to about the middle slowly and the outside temperatures was still around 100 degrees mm-hmm. we got past wall south dakota we were about five minutes ahead of the storms that were blowing up across the highway they never developed into severe status but you know it was, it was still some pretty hard downpours uh, look like on the radar, we got past South Dakota. I backed the speed back down. The temperature stayed right there in the middle. And that was it. I have Good, man. Af- after three hours going across that freaking state with a hundred degrees and the engine temperature constantly running warm. I have no plausible explanation for why it suddenly cooled off. Other than the fear of getting pelted by baseball size hail. Yeah. So that was that was sort of like the the interesting adventure 
Uh, but I can't complain about the car one bit. It did everything I asked of it. Um, Good. It did. It didn't throw one hesitation. It didn't throw one one suggestion that it 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 wasn't just gonna just take care of business. So, Bravo Ford, you built a pretty good car twenty seven years ago. Exactly. <laughs> Sorry to talk your ear off, everybody. No, that was that was fun. Um, so I'm not gonna say that it's going to happen, but tentatively, we might have another cross country uh guest on the podcast to talk about his adventure. So. No, I love stuff like that. Like, you know, for me, it's generally I drive across Ohio. I drive from one side of Ohio to the other or I drive from one corner of Ohio to the other, mm -hmm. depending on which holiday it is. So, no, it's always cool to hear things like that. My things are a couple hundred miles. Your things are over a thousand miles. Well, I, I mean, I, I haven't I usually do this once a year, you know, to go back to see yeah, family. It's totally. just I usually rent a new car because. I mean, my Mazda is a 2004. It, it's a good car, but my wife uses it around here. The Mustang is supposed to just be a local fun car. But mm -hmm. for the price of renting a car this time, I bought the show. And that's and that's how I worked it into my budget. So that's why yeah. that's why the Mustang was called to duty. But friends, listeners, everybody out there. I'm sure I speak for Bruce when I say we would love to hear your special car stories like that. Oh, totally. I, I would love I to hear I know everybody that. has to have like one of those moments where it's like, is this car alive? Does this car know what's going on? And I want to hear those. Email us podcast at motorone.com. Comment on our articles that go up every Friday at motorone.com. Comment on our videos at Motor One Podcast. If you're listening on Spotify, Apple, Google, whatever audio platform you're on, send us that email. Take it, take some time and say, Gosh, I remember when I was driving through the Rocky Mountains in my Chevy Silverado like 15 years ago, and the engine, I was just trying to nurse it over to, you know, an exit that's 20 miles away, but we had to get over the mountains, and I didn't think we were going to get over the mountains, and then all of a sudden the engine just came to life, and we did it, and then it died as I'm going down, you know, I'd love to hear those stories, everyone would love to hear those stories, so share those with us, please. Oh yeah, totally. I would love to hear that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, this was a fun episode. I, this yeah. was just like, this was fun car talks type stuff and not car talk, the show, but just like car talking, um, car rambling. Yeah. So yeah, we exactly. love to have you along for the ride. Um, but as always, good afternoon, good evening, or good night. We really appreciate everyone who listens. And again, as we've said during the show, podcast at motor com. you can comment on our youtube uh motor one podcast like we're there we love your comments we love reading your comments like trust me we've had some less than positive comments and it's still interesting to see what people think of us and you know i think about them so yep. it you know if you think there's something we need to change let me know and you know I might not change it if I think you're a jerk, <laughs> but I'm at least going to read it. We're at least going to uh, read it. Exactly. Darn to. Uh, uh, but yeah. Um, so yeah. Thank you for everyone. Um, thank you for all your comments, all your listens, everything. Um, uh, you don't need to know this, but subscribers are actually, we're coming close again to that one subscriber a day goal, which is kind of always my thing. So, And, yeah, and it is worth mentioning. We are we are brainstorming and trying to come up with some ideas for some special challenges. So we are. Um, yeah, we, we we're going to try to do more of that in the future. We want to keep growing the podcast. Help us grow. We appreciate yep. you. Yeah. So with that, I will say, like I said, good afternoon, good evening or good night. But yeah, this was a fun one. And thank you, everybody. And uh, bye bye. We'll see you. Bye bye.